guys, Brooklyn Attic Books here, and today I'm here to discuss The Day of the Trifids by John Wyndham. So for a book that was written in 1951 and classified as science fiction, I was blown away by this book. You see all those tabs in the book? These are all quotes, and I'm going to read you all of these because if that doesn't convince you that this is a badass book, then I don't know what will. This book is so much more than just about killer plants. I'm just going to say this out right now. I've seen some of the reviews on Goodreads this morning. As I was putting out my review, I always kind of like scan through other people's review. And I don't know what's going on. Am I looking too into this? People have reached out to me and have said that John Wyndham is probably one of their favorite authors. And he is so under the radar and not credited very much and it's so weird because this is my first book that I picked up by him and it's definitely not going to be the last I actually have two more books that are wild check out these covers I have this one the midwitch cuckoo and stowaway to mars how cool are these right but I'm reading more and more about like the synopsis of his other novels and dude, they are, they're good. I'm going to be, I'm going to be on the lookout for him. He's going to be an instant buy when I come across his books. As I said, this book is so much more than just killer plants. So this is a post-apocalyptic novel and it's eco horror. And yes, humans did create the problem and it will be the downfall of society in this book. This book really looks at human struggle in the aftermath of tragedy. And I I am here for it. I loved it. There was so many amazing observations and dialogues between the characters of the book that just shape how, how society really thinks, how people really think about these things. It, it, hands down, this is really good. And unpopular opinion, there's no way, no way, no way. If you read this and you know that it came from 1951, you're going to be like, wow, McCammon and King both ripped off this book for Swan Song and the, and the Sand. I'm just saying, I, I really think that they just read this and went, okay, hold my beer, I can do this. And then just presumptuously wrote an obnoxious thousand page story on it. Honestly, you want my honest opinion? You, you just have to be a good author to get a point across in 200 pages. You don't need a thousand pages. So there's a quote that Gisela, our protagonist's main love interest, says, and it goes, Anybody who has had a great treasure has always led a precarious existence, she said reflectively. And that is the truth, right? And along the lines of just how the beginning of the novel really shapes, here's another quote. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Let that sink in. So that's kind of the beginning of the story. And then we start to find out that there's really like also an illness that takes people out. There's also, uh, there's also no more doctors. There's no more like, you know, electricity being produced unless, you know, you have the means to generate it yourself. And it's quite interesting. Little communities of people start popping up. I feel like the most powerful quote in this entire book, uh, was this self pity and a sense of high tragedy are going to build nothing at all. So we had better throw them out at once, for it is builders that we must become. And a couple pages later, when the characters are still discussing um, human intellect and what they need to do to move forward, right? So like, the old world is out, and now you have to be able to survive. You can't just go to a 9 to 5 and get a paycheck at the end of the week to survive. That's not how the world works when... <laughs> A post-apocalyptic situation occurs right so I quote we have not simply to start building again we have to start 
thinking again, which is much more difficult and far more distasteful. So there's a character in the book that reminds me of like a union rep, basically. Like he can, like in his previous life before the post-apocalyptic event occurred. So basically he can essentially talk to anybody about anything and reason with them, but in their own way. So there's a, there's a, a line in here where uh, they come upon a group of people that are religious and they have their own little community and it's beautiful and wonderful. But everybody in the community has no idea how to survive. So there's a section where this character turns on the generator and all of a sudden there's, there's electricity, there's lights. And so this woman says, oh my God, there's light. And he says, well, you know, it was right there. Like, all you had to do was go and turn it on. She says, it's not my fault if I'm not any good at things like that. And so his response is, I'll differ there. It's not only your fault, it's a self-created fault. Moreover, it's an affectation to consider yourself too spiritual to understand anything mechanical. It is a petty and a very silly form of vanity. Everyone starts by knowing nothing about anything, but God gives him, and even her, brains to find out with. Failure to use them is not a virtue to be praised. Even in women, it is a gap to be deplored. Well, it's 1951 and the character obviously was a little bit sexist and she did come back at him you know she fucking definitely clapped back but um i i thought i thought that was amazing i i thought that that line in itself speaks volumes you know people who make excuses all the time for the shitty situations they're in explain right there it's vanity. He also says, and this is all like within, you know, these are dialogues that these people are having amongst themselves. It's amazing. It's amazing dialogue. Changed condition must mean changed outlooks. Simple, beautiful, straightforward. Most people aren't reasonable. Even though they'd protest that they are, they prefer to be coaxed or wheedled or even driven. That way they never make a mistake. If there is one, it's always due to something or somebody else. This going headlong for things is a mechanistic view and people in general aren't machines. They have minds of their own, mostly peasant minds at their easiest when they are in the familiar furrow. There's like a lot more quotes. I'm not going to bore you guys with it. Uh, I really hope that you pick up a copy. And if you ever come across some John Wyndham, grab him. Grab it. I've literally never come across John Wyndham books in the wild. Never come across it really ever, even in a used bookstore. So if you do, you need to grab it. He's excellent. 200 pages got the point across. I mean better better theology better examples of like what humans might go through way better way better than anything else i've ever read superb till next time guys